around and shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck, give them a high five, a hello, an air five, a handshake, however that works. If they don't know you, you they may not know. If you don't know them, they may not know you. And sharing a name and learning a name is always a great honorable thing to do with people that we meet and cross paths with. Amen. You may be seated today. Miss Deborah, I don't want to put you on the spot anywhere publicly. And Brother Ricky, you certainly feel free to interject. But how are things going in, in that situation? We've been praying for you. We just we just stand with you in the sorrow and the grievance of your loss today. And I know that there are details that you're going to fill me in on later. But just know we love you and we're praying for you. Anything that you feel like we need to know. It is. Amen. Sure. Amen. You're very welcome. Wow. Okay. Wow. Kind of proximity. Good. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great to have family. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise today. Thank you, God. Amen. And amen. When you when you receive a text, it has to be broken up because you can't really send more than 20 at a time based on the program that I have in most iPhones anyway. So anytime you get you're a part of something, you're part of a fragment of an overall whole. And uh, so not everybody's always aware of those same things. And we try to be discreet in what we do pass along and, and, and try to be careful and make sure everybody's aware of that. But uh, uh, Miss Deborah's mother had passed. And, and uh, so we've been praying for them and uh, lifting them up. And we'll find out in more detail how we can minister. But I like what Ricky said. If you've not met this couple yet, please make it a point to meet them. Very, uh, Their hearts just are so impressive uh, in the short time that I've known them. I feel like I've known them for forever. And uh, But their hearts to serve and to give are just there. And uh, not everybody, here's the thing that we don't always understand about everybody we meet. We sometimes have a tendency to think that everybody's just like us. And so they have the same likes, dislikes. Uh, they get excited about the same things, unexcited about it. And we're not. We're different. Somebody turn to somebody and say, we're different. We're just different. And uh, we got different upbringings, different outlooks, different everything. And uh, but but each of us have in some way been bestowed by God, by his spirit in ways to be gifted, to add that gifting to the body of Christ. And, you know, lesson one million seven hundred and ten on why we need to go to church is that we have gifts to bring in contribution. Next week, there'll be a meal of some degree, and I know it'll be a pitch-in, and this church is a great pitch-in church, uh, great food all the time. But think about that. Every one of our lives really, not just in church, but in society as a whole, is a pitch-in, and we're bringing what we're good at cooking. Amen? And uh, so God has made us in specific ways with special gifts and talents, and those are things utilized not only to enrich our lives and make us feel complete when we operate in them, but they're also to help other lives that may be incomplete without them feel that sense of uh, hope, joy, and, and, and satisfaction when you are working in your areas of gifting. You say, well, I'm, not, I'm a nobody. I don't have anything. Well, you're a somebody, and uh, you have something. Amen. And God can help us. Sometimes it's a lifelong discovery. Sometimes in just centuries or, or, or decades, rather, uh, we may have greater strengths that come out than others. But I'm going to tell you something. God is constantly developing us. I, I was sharing with somebody the other day. We are ch when we're children, we're born with adulthood in us. We just grow into it. Amen. And when we're a believer and we're born again, we're born again into the kingdom. But we have Christ within us and we just continue to grow in that. Amen. And in doing so, we bring to the table those things God has gifted us with. And, and it's in that pursuit. I've been talking the last three weeks about can God still lock the lip of the lion? Don't make me say that twice quickly. Amen. But but I do believe that what God has done, he'll do. Amen. And what he's done and he does do still today, he'll do for us when the time is necessary. Amen. So I like to say our God can, our God does, and our God shall. Amen. And so I believe that today. I believe that the same God, we sang about it today, our, he's the same God. 
So his ability to do exceeds our ability to imagine, but it doesn't really have to exceed our ability to understand what he has done. If we'll read his word, he will reveal to us things that are a part of the reality of what we can depend upon God in. Amen. And so, as I've shared before, especially in the context of this message over the last couple of weeks, is the fact that from Genesis to Revelation, the reality remains is that anything, everything, and volumes could be have written down more than what we have here. But what we have here is a concise rendering of what we need to know about God while we live here. Amen. And so, we may not literally face dens of lions, but the reality remains is that there are times that we're going to be overwhelmed by circumstances that seek to devour, would like to devour us, but by the grace and power and might of God, we can stand firm through the night, amen, that's usually when the biggest battles seem to be raging, and find in the morning that we are completely intact because God has kept us, amen, can you give him praise today in this house, thank you Lord. So in the idea of your identity, in the, in, the, in the outward working of those things that are a part of your reflection of God and those things that are a part of how God has created you, Daniel, Daniel like all of us, were, are created to have a relationship with God. And Daniel had a relationship with God. And long story short, if you get in Daniel chapter 6 and read what we've talked about the last couple of weeks, you'll realize that it was Daniel's, Daniel's favor from God that made, that made those around him jealous. And and but it was also his relationship with God that kept him safe when they acted in their angst and, and, and aggression towards him. He was kept by the power of God. And I want us to know today, can we say that out loud? I am kept by the power of God. I am kept by the power of God. There are things around me that I don't even recognize, would love to devour me if given an opportunity, but God protects me. Amen? God doesn't keep us from jumping off cliffs, so we're absolutely determined we're going to jump off a cliff, but I guarantee you, you'll have, to be, you'll have to filter that decision through a lot of the help from the Holy Spirit saying, you don't have to do this. You don't have to think this way. You don't have to move in this direction. Amen? So oftentimes, when we do what we do, when we do what we do, we're doing it because we decide to do it. Amen? And, and it's not because God doesn't offer us opportunity. It's just that sometimes we get headstrong. Are we ever headstrong? Anybody here ever get stubborn and just kind of do things their own way, right? It's a learning process, not overnight, but over time. We grow, right? I'm I'm a baby with adulthood in me, but I have to mature. I have to grow. I have to move through stages of development, learning sometimes, unfortunately, by, by the error of having made my choice and living with the outcome of those things. Uh, but I do believe that God can still lock the lip of the lion. And I believe that we live in spiritually aggressive times. I believe that while we are alive today, there are many things that are occurring around us. And we are always looking for hope. And sometimes we look for that well, it's not wrong to look for hope anywhere you can find it, but I believe it should be you and I, right, that bear light and bring hope to people in the lives that we interact with, we connect with, and we cross, rather it be people we know or people we've just met or people we'll never meet. Uh, uh, it, we can be an example. We can be kindness in motion. We can be those kind of things that reflect the nature of God in a world that is adverse and contrary to the holiness and the love of God. Amen? You and I are difference makers. We're light bearers. We're salt and light in this world, and, and that that's, those are elements of impact, and God can use us in those ways. And I believe that Daniel was a person of impact. This isn't the story of uh, Belteshazzar in the lion's den. This is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel is a name that contained with it the, uh, the trace identity of God. And I believe that you and I have a name written in heaven that uh, uh, we will one day see discovered. But, but, but the reality is, is that I believe that our name somewhere in the, cos in, in the connection to God are, are contained within it the framework of God. We are children of God. God. I am a child of God if by faith I have accepted the gift of God through the Son of God to give to me by the Spirit of God salvation because faith believes it and my heart declares it and my mouth says it. Amen. Can we give God praise today? Salvation is real. Relationship is real. And the capacity to walk in a relationship with God like Daniel had is still available today, really even more so because Daniel might have had the unction, the, the outward adorning of the Spirit of God upon him because of his desire to walk in obedience to the things of the Lord and to honor God, and that is at the gist of our Christianity. But you and I today have the privilege of the Holy Spirit now dwelling within this temple made clean. Can somebody say amen? 
I'm not left to my own devices. I'm not left to my own personal strengths and willpowers. I am able to rely upon the Spirit of God on a day-to-day basis to help me, help me to navigate through the strict, terrible, stormy waters of life at times, but also I'm available to the Spirit of God so that when I have crossed that line, He can speak to my heart, I can come to my God, and the Lord can forgive me and have absolute no break in that relationship with us and God in fellowship and maturity. Amen? So thank God for that as well. I have a friend. I got. I woke up this morning. I've I've got a few of the, I've got the DNA of my original notes in here somewhere, but but I had some things really kind of hit my spirit as I woke up this morning. And I have a friend who's a taxidermist. Everybody know what a taxidermist is, right? Uh, he, he has stuffed lifelike busts of things formerly alive everywhere. All right, stay with me. It's his job to take something that's been killed and prop it up in such a way as to make it look regal and as natural as it was before its animation was changed. Stay with me. It's his skill that gives the impression of what that kill looked like before and after its lifeblood was cut off. Are you following me today? It's that deer head mounted on the wall. It's that sheep put in a <laughs> in a diorama of such that it looks like it's still standing on a rock. It is recreating the 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 personality of that animal prior to its death and usually that death has been at the hands of the one who delivered it to the taxidermist and that remarkable outcome remains as a result of a testimony to give testimony to i went hunting and this is what happened and there we have in the trophy room of the hunter an exact representation of what it was they went after. It's called a trophy, and it hangs in the trophy rooms or a prominence around the above skill of the hunter. Are you with me? Are you staying with me? In Hebrews 11, there is what many Bible scholars call the Holy Hall of Fame or Faith's Hall of Fame. But the question I have today is, does Satan himself have a trophy room? Does the enemy himself have renditions of representation from those things he has hunt and sought to kill and was successful as he went out in search of his quarry or his prey? We understand according to Scripture, and we've talked about that, that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If God has a trophy room of all of the greats that through faith have been able to, to, to transition from life to death into the presence and glory of God, how many does, does, does Satan have, metaphorically, uh, a, a trophy room, so to speak, containing the busts and the likeness and the replication, of, uh, the, 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 the recreation or the reanimation and form of those that were once on his hit list and now... In his trophy room. I believe the enemy's after us, don't you? Now listen, I've said it before, but I want to say it again because we can get disconnected from what was determined and, and declared earlier. I don't go around looking for devils on every in everything and, and, and trying to sweep everything. Oh, the, the devil did it. Remember Flip Wilson years ago? We'll really date ourselves. The devil made me do it. Well, uh, the devil's never going to make you do something, but he will certainly assist you as best he can. He will make available opportunities wherever they're available for you to do whatever he would bid you to do. And again, we've talked about the fact that the devil is not the equal evil opposite of God. He doesn't have omnipresence, omniscience. He's not omnipotent by any way. He is a created being who fell in rebellion to God and has a strong, aggressive disdain for the things of God. And the word of the Lord is clear that we're not ignorant of him. And the reason we're talking about him today is, for one, we live in a fallen world, and the enemy is still actively involved in the pursuit of destroying your life in Christ. And not only just destroying your life in Christ, but removing from you the peace that's a part of that relationship that comes from knowing God. He wants you to fall on the rocks of your own lustful desires and be beaten to death by the things that your flesh craves in order to bring you into a place of bondage. His hope, much like the story we see related in the life of Daniel, is that his intent is that he can so scare you off the mark that you will compromise your character in order to save your flesh. 
And that's a constant battle in our lives and our world and one that we need to stay on top of. Why? How do we do that? By letting the Word be a lamp unto our feet, by letting prayer be a place of drawing near to God and allowing the, the light of God and the person of God to reveal to us those things that we need to walk in sync with God. Amen? And we could go on. There's a great deal of preaching there. But the enemy has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he has a game plan that he utilizes efficiently. We see it introduced in the Garden of Eden, and we see it played out throughout the remainder of Scripture oftentimes. We don't live in, in fear of the devil. We respect and fear and honor God, but we recognize that in our service to the Lord, we're not ignorant of His devices. We're not, we're not uh, uh, ignorant to the way that He does His business. But God has revealed to us many things that we need to know about what the Bible call Him, our adversary. And he is as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy. So it behooves us to recognize who we are, whose we are, who we serve, what God makes available to us, but how the enemy would love to disrupt that. Because what can happen in our lives is we get so accustomed to the disruptions of our life that we think that, and it is a normal part of life, but if we're not careful, we carry on rather than get back into a place where we can be in attention to the things of God. We kind of assume Assume these setbacks are just natural and to be expected, and we kind of go with the flow. Can I remind you today that you and I are called to go against the flow? We're not called to be actively rebellious for the sake of rebellion, but the enemy is working to corral us into a place that saints and sinners all go to the same uh, into the same way of conducting their lives, conducting their affairs. But let me tell you something. There was something different about Jesus. There was something different about the way he carried himself. There was something different about the way he talked. There was something different about the way that he reflected God to the world that he was in. And let me tell you something. There, is some, there needs to be something different about you and I, and we are not puppets to the, to the devil, and we are not available to the things of this world to such a degree that we just roll over and make them a regular part of our life. There has to be an element of rebellion in our heart, not to the things of God, but to the ways of this world to say, not so, devil. I am not walking in a place where you can have access to my life. You will not ambush me, steal from me, or destroy this relationship I have with God. And there are so many layers and levels we can talk about with regard to that. Four things I want you to get today that are new to this message that I felt like the Lord dropped to my spirit today that I want to give to you as well. Again, we see the garden. We see Daniel. We see various elements of, of exposure to his tactics that help us to draw a conclusion that this must be the way that the enemy acts or reacts towards us. One of the first things he does is he draws us away from giving attention or focus to God and His Word in our life. One of the biggest tools of the enemy is distraction. If he can move you, they say, when I was talking a moment ago about interruption. I've read studies where once you're doing something, you're in a flow and a go and it's working. But once you get interrupted, a phone call, somebody steps in your office, hey, can I talk to you about something for a minute? And you get interrupted, it takes you almost 20 to 30 minutes to get back into a place where you're ready to start moving again. That's why very little stuff gets done in offices sometimes, because we get so interrupted in the onward growth flow of what we're trying to accomplish that it just seems like we're taking two steps forward and three steps back. So enemy understands that human nature quality about us, and he will oftentimes interrupt things in such a way as to cause us to take steps backwards while we're attempt attempting to take steps forward. That's why we see many good things interrupted. I'm not going to give examples today, but I think you can fill in the blanks. That's why we start out January 1st, ready to go to the gym, and by February 2nd, we're seeing if we can get out of our contract. It, 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 there are ways, we can, because we find out good intentions are wonderful, but if we don't have follow-through, we will find just actually available, we will get detoured and our original plans will get destroyed. And one of the things the enemy would love to destroy is your consistency and your in sync walk with the Lord. Somebody say amen. Second thing he'll do is he'll detour us from wanting God's purposes and plans played out in our life. You ever notice the ebb and flow? Some days, man, an off again relationship with God. We love the Lord. Don't get me wrong. We can, we're a married him, but we just have highs and lows. Amen. It, it's not always the honeymoon. It's not always a vacation. You know what I'm saying? There's the day-to-day -day life. Can I tell you? 
tell you the romance exists not on the days of celebration, but those days in between when you're having to deal with the stuff that you didn't anticipate coming. Suddenly you're ambushed from one side into the next uh, based on other things, but yet you stay together. Why? Because you have a marriage contract or because you had a ceremony? No, but because you love one another in spite of all of the things that are against uh, the relationship and trying to work to tear at the fabric. There is a love that keeps us together. Amen. And we'll look to Tony and uh, Captain and to Neil for that. But listen, the enemy wants to detour us, detour us from wanting God's purposes and plans played out in our life. We, we, we go for a while and we say, oh, that's good. And then pretty soon we get so distracted and so detoured by the other demands of our life. And, and we're not minimizing them because they are demands. There are things that pull on us, tug on us that are needed by us. You have to work. Why? Because you've got bills to pay. Amen. Those are real demands. They're not Satan. They're not ungodly. They're not your flesh. Those are just real demands of life. But the enemy would love to get us so focused on the demands and that's wrung out by the things that we're in, living through, and dealing with. Amen? And if he could, he would love to deliver us from wanting God's purposes. Because let me tell you something. It takes intentionality to pray. It takes, in, unless your back's against the wall, then we seem to pray without problem. But 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 I, I've said it before. Dan, Daniel didn't learn to pray when he was in the midst of problems. Daniel learned to pray because it was a part of his life. And when those things began to turn around in Daniel's life, he didn't have to learn how to pray. He already knew how to pray. He just began to pray in a different environment. Amen. The same prayers in a different place. And the enemy, if he could, he would detour us because he knows the difficult times are coming that God allows because the Lord, listen, not everything is of the devil and not everything do I just do to myself. There are times that God will allow us to come under the scrutiny of his scripture and of his spirit so that we, not so that God could know us, he already knows us, but so that we can know us. And if we find ourselves becoming easily detoured, uh, unenamored with God, then we need to do the kind of things that cause us to change our attitude and posture. Attitude is, again, an aeronautical term. It's about posture. And if I were to counsel couples that were having difficulty, I would say, well, let's examine what you're doing. Let's find out what you're not doing. And let's start doing things that nurture the relationship in a loving, kind, and, and growing way, right? And so the same thing can be understood about the things of God. If we, are detour, if we are detoured in our passion for the things of God, it may be that we are putting our focus on the wrong things. And you know what? If you go to the garden, guess what? He, the, the devil did what every magician does. He redirected their attention elsewhere while he worked his magic. Amen. And if the enemy could, he would get us so distracted and detoured by looking at other things that we fail to remember the priority of placing God in superiority to everything else. Amen. Somebody say amen. The enemy tries not only to draw us away or detour us from, but he divides us from the Lord and causes us to make decisions independent of the Lord's influence or direction. And so oftentimes he will do that because a matter will arise and suddenly we become fearful, we become anxious, and we don't like to think about those things in those terms. But the reality is, is in those areas, we need to grow in dependence upon God. We need to recognize somewhere, again, don't have time to preach here today. There's a lot of simplicity that if we would apply it to our relationship with God would help us in so many ways. And, and one of those things is to understand, recognize, remember that God is who he says he is. God can do what he's already done again, and God is looking out for my best. And if I'll trust him, no matter how harsh the weather I may be in is, I can trust that the Lord will see me through. And somewhere along the line, our faith has to graduate to a point that we take with calm chaos, amen, that we take with calm calamity. I like what, what after two weeks of fasting on the open sea, uh, 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 my beautiful niece, uh, her father and I are, are brothers-in-law, but brothers-in-heart as well. And we had the distinct opportunity to uh, uh, go fishing together in the Gulf. And both of us out in the middle of those waves uh, were at the same time trying to tie a knot. So here we were trying to look at something very minute and while we were doing that the boat in the ocean still moving because nobody just stops for you i know you're precious but things just don't stop for you even if you got a problem and we both just got sick we both just got ugh, 
kind of that way. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and so those kind of things happen. They come and they disrupt our life. Amen. And, 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 and so in those situations, if we're not careful through the ebb and flow of life, we can get all kinds of uh, 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 different outlooks on things. But here's Paul in Acts 27. And, and, and suddenly he's, on the, he's in a boat that's a, got a destiny to sink. And yet he was able to stand firm and say, the Lord's angel stood by me this night. And here's what God had to say. Somewhere along the line, we got to be stable in unstable situations. We have to allow the spirit of the Lord to have access to our heart so that God can speak to us words of peace and calm, even in the midst of turmoil and storm. Amen. And it's only that 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 that, that it's only when we get to those kind of places that our faith is growing in such a way as to bring the stability that flesh and conversation and TED talks and con- self-confidence never could. Amen. My confidence needs to be in God. But if the enemy can separate you from your conscious, your, your conscious uh, uh, dependence and, and, and confidence in God, he'll do with you what he did with those men in the nation of Israel who sat 40 days paralyzed under the dark, deep uh, shadow and bad breath of Goliath. Amen. The, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Those men were there 40 days. David wasn't there 40 minutes And he began to draw into that conflict. Why? Because his confidence wasn't in himself. His confidence wasn't in his nation. His confidence wasn't in his brethren. His confidence was in God. Amen. And it's in this matter. We'll talk about David, Lord willing, here in a minute. I doubt it, but we'll see. Uh, uh, But he wants to divide us from that. He wants to say, okay, there's the Sunday you, and there's there's the high moment emotional you with God, but then there's the regular everyday you with God. And there is no division. You and God are one when you know the Lord. Just like Teresa and I are one in marriage, we are one with God in our relationship of salvation. And if the enemy can divide you and get you to a place where you think it's me and God up here and me here. No, no. It is I am seated in heavenly places with Jesus. I have a different perspective and a different promise. And I don't have to look at life through the lens of the horizontal. I can look at life in the lens of the vertical because I am not seated among the prince and the peace and the powers of this world, but I am seated in heavenly places. And that gives me a whole different posture to look down onto the world that I live in and am trying to live through. Amen. So if he can, he'll divide us. He asked Eve, is that really what God said? And he tried to pit her memory and her relationship and her recollection against what he was saying in the now. And if he can be successful at dividing us, he'll also get successful at leading us. And that brings us to the fourth thing he does. He will, how often do you get to use this word, but I like it. He will discombobulate our internal, okay, we don't have it back there. You got it up here. He will discombobulate our internal moral and spiritual compass. He'll, he'll just get it all turned out of whack and get us not, and feel like we're following, we're doing, we're moving. Activity in itself. Listen, there are times to move in God and there are times to stand still in the Lord. Amen. And when you're at a crossroad, don't just bust through those options. Take time to let God speak to you. I don't have time to preach here today, but if I did, I'd just be preaching to myself. More problems exist in John Quigley's life because John Quigley thinks he knows in advance the answer because of this thing or that. And when John Quigley needs to stop more times than not and pause and pray and ponder and listen more than I act, there's a time to do. There's a time to sit still and let God speak to you. Be still and know that I am God. That's not just an arresting statement for dramatic purposes. That's an activity that we can engage. There are just times that we shut off the light, shut the door, shut off the TV, shut off the phone, shut off the stove, and just hear from God. And I'm just foolish enough to believe God will speak to you in one way or another. So the enemy wants to draw us away, wants to detour us, he wants to divide us, he wants to discombobulate us. Because there are three things that we need to learn about Satan today. Number one, Satan hates, period. Aggressive rejection of God will always result in anger that manifests in ill treatment of God and others and often ourselves. We will turn our backs on God, turn our backs on ourselves, turn our backs on others, and we realize that hate has this absolute diabolical, acidic, 
poisonous opposite of love. Satan hates, he hates God, he hates humanity, creation, he hates the believer who, ha who by faith lives in defiance to everything he opposes. That's so funny because the enemy of his own depiction and description is a defiant, rebellious aggressor. But he hates it when children of God are, are aggressive, defiant uh, 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 resistance to the things of the flesh. He hates it when we, empowered by the Spirit, live out the nature of Christ in a world that he is striving to cause to reject him. He, you know, they say many times that we don't like in other people what we don't like in ourselves. And even though these things depict Satan and his rejection of God, he loathes about you and I that we live that way for God. Do you hear me? Our role in life is not to get as many check marks as we can by going to church or this thing or that. Our role in life is to serve and honor God, draw near to the Lord, allow ourselves to be vessels, conduits of the Spirit of God, and to be ambassadors and emissaries of heaven, loving people with offering to them mercy and grace. Amen? And living in such a way that our faith glorifies God and everybody who sees Him lifted up is drawn to Him. Amen? Satan hates... That's what he brings to the table. And his attempt to do all the other things that we talked about is to instill in you his DNA. We're already born in a flesh nature that rejects God if left to itself. But the enemy would love to, to exacerbate that, make it worse, add to it. So he not only brings with him all of these other things, but in the attempt to do so, he wants to aggravate and elevate hate in your life. Turn to somebody and say, I ain't a hater. I ain't a hater. I'm not going to be. I'm going to love and serve the Lord. Secondly, Satan seeks. Somebody say Satan seeks. He goes shopping. He hopes to find vulnerable victims of which to take advantage of, to kidnap, to rape, and to abuse. So that's why we have got to cultivate our faith. Why? Because Ephesians said, where do I stand behind the shield of faith? What do I carry? The sword of the Spirit. How are you covered? With the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, my waist girt about with truth, and on the by my feet I'm walking in the sandals of peace. Amen. And so, so, so the enemy would love to keep us naked, unclothed, naked and afraid. Amen. He would love to keep us exposed in all kinds of areas. So he seeks to find out who it is that he can take advantage of. He's seeking and those that are, that, that are less susceptible to the Spirit of God at work and more prepared and attentive to those things that the enemy makes available to him. He's looking for those who are not walking under the guardianship of God, but who are carelessly, casually, flippantly walking through their world unprotected, unguarded, unready for his attack. I've shared it before go out and kill, uh, he, he looks, he looks for the weak, he looks for the feeble, he looks for the unprotected, the ones that are lingering behind the rest of the herd. He's looking for those who he can attack easily and can take down without resistance. He's looking for those who are not looking for him. I'm telling you today that you and I don't need to look for a devil under every rock and every stick, but the reality remains is that we must be cognizantly aware that the enemy plays and plays for he plays games and he plays for keeps and he's not playing at all. He would love to destroy, steal and kill you in the process of your service and surrender to God. He would love to come into your life because he's seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for every opportunity to take advantage of your unguardedness. In order to bring ruin, listen to me, you, the word, the spirit, relationship of God gives us discernment, discernment because there are times that our life and our situation are difficult and hard because it is the love of God taking us to the woodshed. Whom He loveth, He chasteneth. He brings into correction and order because He realizes we're walking out of alignment and He doesn't want us to suffer the needless pain that our flesh will cause us when we walk our own way. But then the enemy will work to ambush us at moments of weakness. When you're alone, when you've had a difficult situation occur in your life, and we could continue to fill in blanks, there's a difference between the chastening of God, which is working for order, and the, and, and, and the assault of the enemy that's working to bring chaos. 
The enemy is looking for every opportunity to take advantage. He seeks. He seeks. And that's why we must cultivate our faith. Faith doesn't just happen. It doesn't just occur. Faith is cultivated. And when we cultivate our faith, it makes us less susceptible. Doesn't mean we'll be free from attack. Doesn't mean that we'll be free from flesh challenges on how to think and to do and to speak and react. But it'll make us less susceptible because we're filtering things through the hard life and the Word of God. It'll make us more prepared and more attentive to our surroundings. One of the things you'll hear any survivalist say is live with your head on a swivel. Be aware of your surroundings. More and more, unfortunately, you see, you see warnings come across Facebook telling women to be attentive to their surroundings as they make their way from Walmart to their car. You would think we lived in a hostile, aggressive world, and you know what? We do. And so, so we're told to be, called, to be aware of your surroundings. This message and these messages are just your pastor saying, be aware of your surroundings because the enemy is after anything that he can exploit to satisfy his own hunger and to destroy you in the process. Do you hear me today? And then as we started, Satan loves his trophies. He loves his trophies. But most assuredly loves the one he snipes from God's side of the fence. I guarantee he would be happy for any and all. I, I guarantee you there, there are scriptures we love to read, scriptures we hate to read. Satan knows scriptures more than we do, but I guarantee you, here's one of his favorites. I guarantee he's got it highlighted. I guarantee he's got a star beside it. I guarantee you, it's his song. It's one of the Psalms in his heart that he would read every day. And it's this verse Wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there are that go in thereat. Oh, can I tell you, he loves that scripture. It just reminds him that more people that hear it will reject. God than the ones who hear it and receive God. And I guarantee you it makes his heart happy. And he's, he's overjoyed at anything he can do to bring hurt to the heart of God in those ways. But let me tell you something. His greatest trophies are not those who have, who have rejected God from the beginning and stayed on that path. His are going to be those who have known God, been exposed to God, been around God, aware of God, uh, open to and available to the grace of God, the love of God, and yet they still have rejected God because of differences in their life, circumstances that left them sour, things they didn't understand about God and weren't willing to bring to Him to find out the answer to. His trophy room is filled with people who have, that he loved that 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 he loves to have on his trophy are people who knew God or were aware of God and yet resisted God because he was successful at hunting them down and bringing whatever alchemy and chemistry and recipe he brought to the table in order to serve them a meal that they died from little by little. Satan hates everything. He seeks to destroy everything he touches. But he loves his trophies. He loves his trophies. Do godly people come under attacks or is it just weak Christians? David knew what it was like to come under attack. David said in Psalm 22, 21, Save me from the lion's mouth. Not just a real lion and certainly in his conditions, but... We understand what he's saying, right? Psalm 7, verse 1, O Lord my God, in Thee do I put my trust. Save me from all of the, them that persecute me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver. King David understood what it was like to be under the attack of the enemy as he came through various ways into his life. The Apostle Paul knew what it was like to be under attack. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, that all the Gentiles might hear. Listen, he echoes the same thing that David would earlier declare. And I was delivered out of the mouth of of the lion. Does God know how to shut the lips, lock the lips of hungry lions? He does. He does. He does. He does. He does. He does. And guess what? He does. He knows and he does. 
What He's done, He'll do. What we've seen, we'll see again. If we'll put our faith in God and learn to put our faith in God and learn to lean and trust on God, we'll see the hungry lions will continue to go hungry while we're in their midst. Daniel find out, found out he locks the lips of lions. David found out he locks the lips of lions. Paul found out he locks the lips of lions. And I'm here today to declare on April 30th, 2023, God still locks the lips of lions. And if we will lean upon the Lord, if we will trust in God, if we will call upon the Lord, if we will put our trust in Him, God will lock the lip of the lion and we will be delivered out of His mouth in every occasion occasion because great is the God we serve and he is the God who changes not amen and amen and amen and amen and amen I believe that God is able to rescue us restore us and even when we faltered and fail and f- failed and fall he is able to reuse us in his kingdom amen we may be bitten today but we can be better tomorrow amen and I believe that God can see us through. What are we going to do in the day of attack? Well, we can do what David did. We can stand in the shadow of the Almighty. We can do what David did and stand in the shadow of the Almighty and remember what he's already done. I I love to preach on David. 1 Samuel 17 is probably one of my favorite chapters in the whole book. But I like David's response. What makes you think you can beat this giant? He said, well, let me just tell you a story. The same God who delivered me from the bear and the lion is the same God. It's the same God. I love that God builds a resume in our life. And we can look and it says, well, it looks like here you're able to de- deliver us from the bear. You can deliver us from the... Listen, don't forget what God has done because you need to remember his resume. Amen. David, we'll do what David did. We'll stand in the shadow of the Almighty. This is what he's done, and this is what he'll do. Amen. Secondly, we need to do what Daniel did. We need to stand in the presence of the Almighty One. Amen. Request through prayer that God shut the mouth of the lions. I can't tell you exactly what Daniel prayed. He probably prayed a much more mature prayer than I would pray. I would be standing there the whole time saying, shut their mouth, shut their mouth. Don't let them eat. Let them go hungry. Lord, declare a lion fast in this den. I'd be praying all kinds of self-preservation things. And maybe Daniel did because he's human like we are. But Daniel was more equipped, more acquainted with prayer. And I guarantee you probably what was happening was just praise and adoration. You know, at the Bible, Paul, Paul, Paul was here in the middle of doing what God called him to in Acts 16. And by the end of the day, he's thrown into the sewer of the jail system. But at midnight, at midnight, at the dawning of a brand new day, what did he do? He and, Pil- he and Silas agreed, let's pray and let's sing. Amen. There is something about the joy that is contained in the heart of the believer that does not look to the aggression and the anguish of our circumstances, but looks to the God who is the answer to everything. Amen. And it begins to do nothing. You can't, I'm going to tell you something, you can't think about God and not begin to praise Him. You can't begin to focus on the Lord and not also want to bow and worship Him. When men got into heaven through, through, through the translation of a vision or whatever the case may be, they were so such an overwhelming presence of God, they wanted to worship angels. And the angels said, get up off your feet. I'm not worthy of this adoration. Oh, but when you see the King, we can't get into the middle of the darkest parts of our lives and not see the King. Amen. And if we'll call upon Him, and when we do, He shows up. He shows up. Stars can be seen better at I've been on a. I've been in the middle of a large city and can't see the stars when I look up. And I've been in the middle of the ocean on a cruise in the dark of night and can see the stars with great clarity. The darkness is not the absence of God; it's the necessity to look up and see with clarity who makes the lights to shine. Amen. We need to do what David did, stand in the shadow. We need to do what Daniel did, stand in the presence. But we need to do what Samson did as well. We need to stand up to the lion. And watch God give you the victory. Refuse to step off the path that leads to your future. Samson was not the best example of things. Great example. He's kind of like Peter of the Old Testament. Great example of what not to do many times. There was a boldness about Samson. When that lion crossed his path and threatened to devour him, he stood his ground. We need to stand our ground. He grabbed that ferocious 
aggressive, arrogant, arrogant, yeah. The enemy is arrogant above all things. Grabbed him by the whiskers and slew him. And then later went back and still reveled in the conquest of his victory by finding honey in the middle of that carcass. Only God can turn stuff around like that. Amen. Only God can do that. So we need to be like these men and others, but we need to be like the Lord in all things. Listen to me. The enemy would love nothing more than to help you put a bushel basket over your light. He would love to do nothing more than to hinder you from exalting the Lord on high that men would be drawn in. He would love to do nothing more than to equip your emotions with all the fear you can handle. Amen. But the reality is, as great is our God. And worthy is He to receive praise and glory and honor. And He is the God that changes not. And the same God that delivered David, the same God that delivered Daniel, the same God that delivered Samson, the same God that delivered Jesus, the same God that delivered Paul, and the same God that if you will read the biographies of great men and women used throughout history, post-Christ arrival, death and resurrection, you'll see that the same God then is the same God today. And you can't lose for winning. And we ought to go bear hunting with a switch because God is on our side. Amen. Can you give him praise today in this house? Amen. And amen. And amen. So don't get discouraged by the headlines. Matter of fact, read God's lines instead of the headlines most of the time. Don't get discouraged by what occurs or doesn't occur. Just recognize that God has his hand on the throttle and that the Lord knows where the brakes are and he knows where the accelerator is and God knows how to deliver us where we're supposed to be. Amen. And he can do it. He can do it, and He will do it. Amen. Would you stand to your feet today in this house? Bless your name, Lord. Let's just worship Him right now. Would you just begin to thank Him for what He... You don't have to list Him. You probably can't remember. Just begin to thank Him. Lord, I thank You for what You brought me through. God, I thank You for what You're bringing me to. But God, I thank You that You are walking with me and that I can trust You. I can lean upon You. You are my confidence. I lean upon you and not my own understanding. God, I need you. I need you. And I want you to have all of me, oh God. Heart, mind, body, and soul. Lord, let me leave nothing out that would attract the enemy to my life. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. I don't want to beleaguer the point. I just want to add something. I watch a lot of camping videos, and one of the things that you have to do when you're camping, especially out where there are other bear, where bears are, you have to bear proof what you want to keep. Your trash, keep because your tree, even your oh, I'm gonna just have got to make a note. I'm gonna preach here. Your trash can draw predators that will tear up your camp and devour everything and destroy everything that you've left vulnerable. You can't just pop into camping. You better learn a little bit about it first. And you can bear-proof things moving at, at a branch that's higher than five feet, five feet away from the trunk and five feet off of the, off of the branch that it's on. But I listened to a guy, and he showed, it, showed this box. He said, there's a place you could put things in now. They create it, and you seal it up, and none of the stench or the odor will get out and draw the bears to you. Amen. Can I tell you today that if our lives are hidden in Christ, if we are covered by the blood and by the cross, and we are striving to come up under the wing of the Father, just like Isaiah, if I just come up under His wing, I'll be, I'll be hidden in the shadow of the Almighty. I can bear-proof my life. I can lion-proof my life. Because what I leave vulnerable, I invite. But if I will come under the shadow of the Almighty, God will divinely protect me, even from my own foolishness, many times. Thank you, Lord. Can we just thank Him? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
Oh, God, you're so much better to me than I deserve. And God, you give me so much more than I could ever possibly attempt to ever on my best day in a, in a, in a, rep in a repetition of my best days hooked together for a million years would never produce. Lord, we praise you today. Help us to step into this day, into this week, into the rest of our lives. God, understanding that the enemy is a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may by permission devour. But Lord, help us to cut off permission. Help us not to permit that in our lives. And Father, help us every day to grow in the grace and the knowledge of your word and to rise up in maturity and stature from being born into your kingdom, into Christ's likeness. And God, today we will thank you and praise you. I pray God govern every thought, every heart, every life, every mind, every hand of everyone in this sanctuary, those who may be joining us online. And God, we commit it to your care today and we trust you for it. We ask you in the name of Jesus for it to be accomplished. And God, we just give you thanks and praise in that same precious name. And everybody in here said amen. And amen. Can you give him praise one more time in this house? Look to the Lord. Look to the Lord.